Rome, Paris, Beijing, Washington DC. All these cities have in common two things, their unquestionable beauty and their comprehensive town planning. Concerned with the ordering of land use and built environments, town planning creates effective transportation networks, sanitation systems, and distribution networks. But it also creates beautiful spaces to live and work, spaces that define the people and cultures they are part of. In the case of Frampol, a small town in Poland, town planning created a uniquely beautiful space for its residents to live in. What its designers could never have known was that it would create chaos and destruction, consigning the entire town to destruction centuries later. With its unique grid pattern radiating from the market square, Frampol resembled a large bullseye when viewed from the air. Though without any military value whatsoever, that alone sealed the town's fate. When the Second World War broke out and fighting swept over the country, that planned town centre made the defenselessless town the perfect experiment for Luftwaffe bombers, looking to test their deadly technology. This is the story of a small and unsuspecting town meeting ultimate destruction at the hands of an uncaring, calculating Nazi war machine. A town in the Lublin district, towards modern-day Poland southwest, Frampol was not a large town. Situated in the heart of the Sand on the Edge forest, one of Eastern Europe's mightiest and oldest woodlands, Frampol was built by the eccentric Count Marek and Tony Butler. Inheriting the lands around the modern town, as well as a substantial sum of money, Butler decided to found a new urban settlement in an area largely uninhabited, Thus, Frampol was founded in 1717 and grew steadily from then on. From 1735, the town had its own Jewish community and cemetery. In 1740, a church was built in the centre of the town. It, like all other buildings in Frampol and other towns in that heavily forested region, were wooden. In 1865, the only stone building in the town was built, a Jewish bathhouse. Life in Frampol in many ways followed the steady rhythms of life typical to that region of Poland. Time was measured by the passage of the sun and the advance of the seasons. Farming and forestry fulfilled the needs of most of the townspeople, as did the production of cloth by a group of artisans, most of whom were Jewish. Here we find the other constant in the lives of the residents of the small town, religion, Communities of both Catholics and Jews found their identity in their faith, though coexisted with one another no less. Religious fasts and feasts, wedding and funerals, all these gave colour and structure to the lives of the residents of Frampol. To this multicultural little town, with its timber homes and humble position, history was something that happened around it. From the 1770s, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was steadily devoured by the three great powers of the region. Russia, Prussia, and Austria. When Frampol found itself as part of the Austrian Empire in 1795, following the third and last partition of Poland, little changed. Napoleon and his legions marched into Poland 10 years later and marched right back out again in 1812. The Russian army, to say nothing of the Russian winter, hot on their heels. Hundreds of thousands had died and still Frampol remained unchanged. With Napoleon gone, the Russians came, and the region came under jurisdiction of the Tsar, until in 1914, it found itself briefly under occupation by a German Kaiser. The Germans had little concern for small towns sheltered in the midst of great forests, unless they came from their own fantastic story tales. Frampel passed unscathed from ruler to ruler, from Russia to Germany, and following the defeat of the Kaiser from Germany to Poland, the sun rose and the sun set, church bells rang, and the people of Frampol danced at their weddings and buried their dead. For them, Frampol had no history, only memory. This is the story of Frampol, somewhat uneventful as it may be. 
For us, European history can seem a tapestry of drama and dynamism. Whether it be the tragedy of famines and murders, the heroism of battles and rebellions, or the steady and benign march of reason and science, European history can often seem bursting at the seams with action. The tale of the little town of Frampel is a lesson in direct contradiction to this image. For this small town highlights that, for the vast majority of Europeans across history, the dramatic events of their day were a distant reality. Dramas played out by dimly recognisable actors on a stage that may as well have been a world away from their daily lives. That is, that would have been the lesson of Frampel were it not for the events of September 13th, 1939. For on that day, memory became history, and the small and uneventful town was forever consigned to the pages of books, documenting the horrors of the most destructive wars in recorded history. Key to this story is the infamous general, Wolfram Freiherr von Rickethofen. His colourful history alone would fill an entire video. He would command the Luftwaffe 8th Air Corps on a mission that would destroy Frambo. You may not have heard of this man, but you should. He came from the highly wealthy families of Prussian nobles, the von Rickenhofen. They were the elite of the German armed forces. Wolfram's cousins included Manfred von Rickenhofen, German fighter ace, better known as the Red Baron, credited with 80 air victories, as well as his young brother, Lothar Rickenhofen, an ace with 40 scores to his name. Wolfram won an Iron Cross while serving in a cavalry division during the First World War. He served as a fighter pilot himself in 1918, watching his cousin, the Red Baron, get shot down and die on Wolfram's very first mission. He went on to claim eight aerial victories before the armistice in November 1918, but in the next World War, Wolfram would be commanding planes, not flying them. He first served as part of the Condor Legion in Spain, commanding the untested planes and pilots of Germany. He was in Spain to aid nationalist forces and destroy the communist-aligned Republican troops. He was not there to bomb civilians, but that's what he did anyway. Sanctioning the bombing of the town of Guernica, famously condemned by contemporaries and historians, Wolfram brought a new kind of terror to warfare. Depicted famously by Pablo Picasso in his chilling work named after the town, Guernica depicts a scene of terror and destruction, the panic and the flames. Its depictions of the horrors of booming remain one of the most influential in anti-war art ever made. The same scene would soon become all too recognisable to the residents of Frampol. Guernica was not to be Wolfram's only controversy, on September the 9th, 1939, a lone reconnaissance plane was passing over the region, gathering information about military targets there. The town of Frampol, with its uniquely ordered streets and buildings, must have caught a crew member's eye. Photos were taken, printed, and shown to commanders. Frampol's fate had been sealed. Three days later, it wasn't the one plane buzzing over Frampol, but 125 Nazi bombers. This time they carried not cameras, but 700 tons of high explosive bombs. Wolfgang described the attack in his book, Haugen and Heimel, Eyes on the Sky. Frampel was chosen as an experimental object because test bombers flying at low speed weren't endangered by AA fire. Also, the centrally placed town hall was an ideal orientation point for the crews. We watched possibility of orientation after visible signs, and also the size of village. What guaranteed the bombs nevertheless fall down on Frampel? From one side, it should make easier the note of probe. From the second side, it should confirm the efficiency of used bombs. Though a work of fiction, it summarizes perfectly the cruel logic that dictated the events of that day. The residents of Frampel would die for an experiment, unwilling test subjects. Lives would be ended to measure the efficiency of Nazi bombs. With gravity and drag, the two chief forces acting against falling bombs, their flight paths were roughly parabolic. Other factors, such as wind and air density, affected bomb flight paths and made them less accurate. To mitigate these factors, low-level bombing or increased bomb speed could be optimized. 
Thus the bombing altitude, type of bomb, and weather conditions all dictated the trajectories of bombs dropped. All these factors had to be accounted for in bomb sites, devices used to drop bombs accurately. Much of these used by the Germans were untested or had variables not fully understood. That was to change. Frampel was a small, defenseless town of 4,000 souls. Possessing a Baroque street plan, it possessed a perfect geometric grid. This provided to be the perfect situation with which to base calculations and measurements. With a historic church and town hall positioned clearly in the central market square, calibrations of equipment could be made easily and accurately. When the bombs began falling, few could understand what was happening. Here was a sleepy town nestled in the midst of a great forest. All would have known about the war, but few could have imagined it would have come to Frampel at all, let alone be carried in the bellies of Nazi warplanes. 700 tons of bombs might be hard to visualize. Take it from us when we say, for that quantity of munitions to fall on such a small town in such a small space of time, the scale of destruction is apocalyptic. A similar amount was dropped on London on the 10th and 11th of May 1941, one of the largest raids in the history of the Blitz. None were prepared. Those who tried to rescue treasured belongings or loved ones were blown apart or were crushed by their collapsing homes. Those not able of body, be them the elderly, small children, or the infirm, had little chance. If they survived the initial falling of the bombs, the fires that broke out in the wooden settlement would take them. A great many did manage to flee, however, utilizing the wide roads that spread out to the north, south, east, and west of the town square. The very same roads that had doomed the town in the first place. Here they formed columns of people, all pressed together in the shared goal to flee the terrible scene. It was at this point when the Nazis tested their own weaponry. A great number of the visiting warplanes were armed not just with bombs, but bullets too and the gunners took the opportunity to strafe the unfortunate residents as they fled. No one was safe. And as it had begun, the attack was over. It had only been two hours since the first plane began the assault, yet the whole town lay in ruins. The before and after pictures, taken by the Germans themselves, testify to the totality of the destruction. 90% of the entire town was decimated. 50% of the residents were killed. Centuries of history went up in smoke, Frampel had been completely obliterated, and General Wolfram's men had left with their measurements. As a matter of fact, the town of Frampel would never recover. Of the 4,000 living there on September the 11th, the day of the attack, only 2,000 would survive. The injured few mourned the dead, but began to rebuild. The Wehrmacht passed through Poland without the town suffering further, the SS, Hitler's executioners, did not. These death squads arrived in 1941, rounding up the town's significant Jewish population and marching them out. Their fate is undocumented. We may never know what happened to these tenacious survivors of the bombing. Speculation is possible. It is unlikely they ever saw the inside of a concentration camp or death camp, for in 1941, these had not yet been constructed. Instead, Jews during the period met their ends at the point of a gun, as German shooting squads roamed the lands. It is in the deep, dark forests that surround Frampel, where the Jews of Frampel were likely taken. The very forests that shape so much of the town's history and daily life, that was the likely scene of this gruesome crime. Today, the small town of Frampel still remains something of a ghost town. Its population remains only 1,400, far less than half what it was before the attack. Its buildings are now concrete and sturdy, but other than that, the reconstructed church and town hall, still situated in the surprisingly large market square. But other than the reconstructed church and town hall, situated in the surprisingly large market square, Framble has lost its character. There are few lessons from the tragedy of Framble, its people died in a way that broke every rule of warfare outlined in the Geneva Conventions, and in a fashion that few moral systems would ever justify. Beyond, perhaps, the warped ideology espoused by Hitler and the Nazi inner circle. Unfortunately, when it comes to the Second World War, 
the inhumanity of what happened to the sleepy town of Frampol, with its peculiar and ruinous street layout, was all too common. That did not, and does not, make it okay. Leaders of Poland still periodically gather in this small town, in a far-flung corner of Poland, to once again remember the unasked for destruction that took place there, in its own way, symbolic of the destruction that occurred across Poland, across the duration of the war. For Frampel was, in many respects, the first victim of Nazi experiments in mass death. Tragically, it would not be the last.